new form of production has emerged in all the major economies of the world. We call it the knowledge economy. It is characterized not just by the accumulation of technology, knowledge, and advanced practice, but by permanent innovation. Uh, it's not associated solely with the high technology industry. It appears in every sector of the economy, in knowledge intensive services and precision scientific agriculture, as well as in advanced manufacturing. In every sector of the economy, however, it remains a fringe. A fringe from which the vast majority of workers and of firms continue to be excluded. This insular character of the new knowledge-intense vanguards has become a tremendous source of both economic stagnation and economic inequality. If the most advanced practice of production remains quarantined, uh, how can we expect economic growth to accelerate? At the same time, this insular vanguard is a motor of inequality. The divisions between the advanced and the backward parts of production have become deeper. The traditional devices for the moderation of inequality, compensatory and retrospective redistribution by tax and transfer, that is progressive taxation and social entitlements, and the defense of small business are insufficient to master the vast inequalities resulting from these structural divisions in the economy. Uh, the new practice of production has enormous potential. At a superficial level, it is characterized by the reconciliation of production at large scale and destandardization or customization of products and services, as well as by the reconciliation of a great decentralization of initiative with the maintenance of coherence and momentum in the process of production. But it has also deeper attributes that remained limited and masked in its present confined state. First, it holds the promise of relaxing what has been the most constant and universal regularity in economic life. The tendency to declining productivity at the margin. In the knowledge economy, there is the prospect of loosening or reversing this constraint. Uh, and the deep reason for this loosening or reversal is that now innovation, rather than being external to the process of production and episodic, becomes internal to the process of production and perpetual. The second deeper attribute of the knowledge economy in its radical, disseminated, and potential form is that it brings closer together productive activity and intellectual discovery. The best firms become like the best schools. And now we can imagine a fundamental change in the relation of the worker to the machine. In Henry Ford's assembly line, or in Adam Smith's pin factory, the worker worked 
as if he were one of his machines through repetitious movements. Now, even as technology becomes more advanced and flexible, we have the possibility of a different relation between the worker and the machine. Everything that we have learned how to repeat, we express in a formula or an algorithm that we then embody in the physical contraption. The machine does for us whatever we have learned to repeat so that we can reserve our supreme resource, time, for the not yet repeatable. And the combination of worker and machine becomes then immensely more powerful than either of them apart. A third deeper attribute of the knowledge economy in its possible reach is a transformation in the moral culture of production. The earlier forms of production, uh, including industrial mass production, was characterized by command and control and the universalization of a low level of trust. The new form of production requires a heightening of the level of discretion and trust allowed and required to all participants in productive activity. An accumulation of social capital, a fluid mixture of cooperation and competition in the same domains of activity. The knowledge economy that exists today is not this knowledge economy with all the potential that I have just described. It is an insular vanguardism, the vanguardism of the exclusive fringes. Why? Mass production, the prior advanced practice, was stereotypical in its organizational and technological core and minimalist in its demands. It was like a kit that could be easily transported from one place to another. The new knowledge-intensive practice of production is not stereotypical and is demanding in its requirements. These requirements are of three orders. First, there are educational and cognitive requirements. The dissemination and radicalization of the knowledge economy requires a very special type of education. An education that accords primacy to analytic and synthetic capabilities over the mastery of dead information that deals with content with an eye to selective depth rather to superficial encyclopedic coverage that prefers cooperation in the social setting of learning and teaching to the juxtaposition of authoritarianism and individualism in the classroom and that is dialectical in its approach to the received body of knowledge. Teaching every subject from contrasting points of view. The second set of requirements for the deepening and spread of the knowledge economy is social and moral. The accumulation of social capital, the enhancement of the disposition to cooperate, allowing for the heightening of the level of trust and discretion in productive activity. The disposition to cooperate is not just a brute fact about society and culture that is either there or not there. It is a power that we can work to strengthen. For example, by the cooperative character of education, by the engagement 
of independent civil society as a partner of the state in the experimental provision of public services and by the responsibility that might be imposed on every able-bodied adult to help take care of other people outside the boundaries of family selfishness. The third set of requirements for a radicalized and disseminated knowledge economy is legal and institutional. It's not enough to regulate the market or to attenuate its inequalities after the fact through retrospective redistribution. To spread and deepen the knowledge economy, it is necessary to innovate in the institutional arrangements that define what a market economy is. We can imagine that these innovations would advance in three great waves, uh, one after another. Uh, in the first wave, the focus would be on one side, the broadening and the coordination of access to productive resources and opportunities, to credit, to technology, to advanced practice, especially in favor of small and medium-sized firms. And on the other side, it would be the development of new forms of governance of the mega enterprises that now control the knowledge economy. With respect, for example, to the big platform companies, the value of which has much to do with the inclusiveness of their networks, instead of breaking them up, which threatens to destroy much of their value, to develop a new form of governance, trusts that would represent the interests of civil society and help control these companies alongside the control exercised by their own self-interested owners. In the second wave of innovations, we would begin to design a new institutional architecture for the market economy on both the vertical axis of relations between governments and firms and the horizontal axis of dealings among firms. On the vertical axis, a form of strategic coordination between governments and firms that would be pluralistic, decentralized, participatory, and experimental. Not the imposition of a unitary trade and industrial policy by the central bureaucratic apparatus of the state, but the conduct of multiple pluralistic experimental strategies by a series of agents in between the state and the firms. Independent support centers initially funded by the state on the model of the historical experience of agricultural extension. And on the horizontal axis of relations among small and medium-sized firms advancing toward the frontier of productivity, networks of cooperative competition so that these firms could pool resources and achieve economies of scale even as they continue to compete against one another. And then in the third wave of more radical transformation of the market economy, the development of alternative regimes of contract and property, different ways of decentralizing economic initiative and access to resources and opportunities, 
that would begin to coexist experimentally within the same market order. Not just the unified property right that would survive in some areas, but also fragmentary derivative forms of property allowing different kinds of stakeholders to have superimposed claims on the same productive resources. The market economy would cease to be fastened to a single version of itself. Uh, now, our ability to satisfy these three sets of requirements, the educational, the social or moral, and the legal and institutional, depends on background conditions in culture and in politics. In culture, the fundamental enabling circumstance is the radicalization of an experimental impulse in every department of social life, uh, achieved through the dialectical character of education, through facilities for changing careers in midlife, and through the engagement of civil society together with the state in the provision of public services. Uh, in this way, civil society, as it were, makes itself. In politics, the fundamental background condition is the development of a high-energy democracy. A high-energy democracy is a democracy that heightens the level of organized popular engagement in political life, that hastens the pace of politics through the rapid overcoming of impasse, for example, through anticipated elections, and that combines the potential for strong central initiative with the ability of parts of a country to diverge from the main road and to create counter models of the national future. The result of these three sets of institutional innovations composing the program of a high energy democracy is to strengthen the ability of society to master its own structure, to diminish the dependence of change on crisis, and to overthrow the rule of the living by the dead. Uh, the central object of debate now about economic growth and development throughout the world is a dilemma. On the one side, conventional industrialization, industrial mass production has ceased to be the reliable shortcut to economic growth. Uh, the first reason why it no longer works is that conventional industrialization uh, is no longer the vanguard. It is either a residue of what used to be the most advanced practice of production, a leftover, or it is a sidekick, a junior partner uh, to the mega firms that now command the controlling heights of the knowledge economy. They have discovered a way to commoditize or routinize part of the process of production. They retreat into an inner sanctum, a hyperinsularity, and then they accord these routinized parts of their plans of production to firms and workers in distant parts of the world. The second reason for the unreliability of conventional industrialization as a path to unconditional convergence to the frontier of production is that it is subject to worldwide labor and tax arbitrage. As firms scour the world for 
places where the returns to labor and the tax burden are lowest. And the third reason is that the firms of the knowledge economy, together with their sidekick, are increasingly able to outcompete what traditional manufacturing can do. Producing the same products and services better at lower cost. So that road to economic growth no longer works. But the alternative, which would be a radicalized and disseminated form of the knowledge economy, an inclusive rather than an exclusive vanguard, seems to be inaccessible. If it is not established, even in the richest economies of the world, with the most educated populations, how can we expect to establish it in the major developing economies? The sole solution to this dilemma is to break it on its second side and to find ways to turn the seemingly inaccessible task of establishing an inclusive form of the knowledge economy into a feasible job by breaking it up into pieces and into stages. That should now be the first object of discussion in political economy. No political economic goal in the world has been more widely or constantly professed than the commitment to socially inclusive economic growth. But this commitment has remained largely empty. It threatens to be little more than a slogan. Uh, the promise of the project of establishing an inclusive form of the knowledge economy is to give practical content to this commitment. Uh, the attempt to make the knowledge economy inclusive, to radicalize it, and to spread it throughout the economy is only part, although it may be the first part, of a much larger project. And this larger project defines an agenda, an agenda of inclusive growth for the world. The first element in that agenda is the one that I have just outlined the inclusive form of the knowledge economy. The second element is the reshaping of the relation between finance and the real economy. Under the present arrangement in all market systems throughout the world, the production system is largely self-financed by the retained and reinvested earnings of firms. What then is the point of all of that money in the banks and the stock markets? Theoretically, it's to finance the productive agenda of society. In fact, the vast preponderance of financial activity under present arrangements has only an oblique and episodic relation to the financing of production. Finance is indifferent to the real economy in good times and destructive in bad times. It becomes a source of instability, of crisis, that then contaminates and harms activity in the real economy. The best way to make finance 
less dangerous is to make it more useful. By enlisting finance in the service of production. We can do that on the negative side by discouraging or even outlawing financial activity that has no plausible relation to the expansion of output or the rise of productivity. And we can do it on the positive side by creating new channels to do on a large scale the undone work of venture capital, of investment in the creation of new assets in new ways. Even if the government establishes independent centers, funds, to tap the sterilized productive potential of the vast amount of savings accumulated in the pension systems of the world. Uh, and to open new channels between the accumulated saving of society and the development of innovative production. Uh, a third theme in this new growth narrative is the transformation of the relation between capital and labor. The radicalization and the dissemination of innovation cannot flourish in a circumstance in which the returns to labor diminish and the majority of the labor force is thrown into radical economic insecurity in the form of precarious employment. Uh, we now see together with the insular form of the knowledge economy and its hyper-insularity, a new putting out system. Work increasingly is organized on a global scale in the form of decentralized networks of contractual arrangements. We must create a new legal regime alongside the traditional labor laws to protect, organize, and represent the mass of precarious employees. But it's only the first step. It's only the first step to a different future. In that future, no human being will be condemned to do the repetitious work that can be done by a machine. And uh, in that future, economically dependent wage labor will be gradually superseded as the predominant form of free work by the higher forms of free labor, cooperation or partnership, and self-employment real self-employment, not the precarious self-employment that is a disguised form of unprotected, precarious wage work. Uh, the fourth theme of this new growth narrative is the combination of security, of antidotes to economic insecurity, with the enhancement of economic agency, with economic empowerment. The dominant project of the governing elites in the richest economies of the world, especially of the North Atlantic world, has now become to combine the social protection of the Europeans with the economic flexibility of the Americans within a barely adjusted version of the inherited institutional arrangements. Uh, we should seek to combine economic security uh, 
not just with flexibility, taken as a euphemism for the erosion of the rights of labor, but with economic empowerment. Here is the basic idea. We give the individual worker and citizen safeguards. We create for him a haven of vital protected interests, uh, endowments, and capabilities so that he can then act and prosper in a world that is open to contest and transformation. The parent says to the child, uh, I love you unconditionally, now go out and raise a storm in the world. The flexibilization of social democracy under this dominant project in the rich economies has the part about the unconditional safeguards, but where is the part about the storm? That is the vital connection. The connection between economic security detached from the possession of any particular job and the opening of social and economic life to a wider plasticity. Then the individual worker and citizen can become like the seraph Abdiel in Paradise Lost, unshaken, unsubdued, unterrified, while society is open to experiment and contest. Uh, the fifth theme in this new growth narrative is the theme of the permanent reconstruction of the market order itself. For these other goals to advance, the market order cannot remain fastened to a single version of itself. The familiar idea of economic rationality as the power to recombine factors of production within an unchanged framework of production and exchange gives way to an ability to innovate in the arrangements that compose the framework of production and exchange. Alternative regimes of contract and property, different ways of organizing decentralized access to resources and opportunities begin to coexist experimentally within the same market order. Uh, the sixth theme in this new growth narrative is the fundamental motivation. The motivation is to make us bigger, uh, a shared bigness. A shared bigness achieved through permanent structural innovation. In ordinary political and economic life, there are two classes of activities. There are the ordinary moves that we make within a framework of arrangements and assumptions that we take for granted. And then there are the extraordinary moves by which, from time to time, we challenge and change parts of this framework. Our interest is to draw closer together these two classes of moves so that our ability to challenge and change pieces of the framework in economic and political life grows more continuously out of the normal business out of the normal moves within the framework, then we become more powerful, bigger. We can engage in a social world without surrendering to it. We can be insiders and outsiders at the same time. The aim, the aim is never just to humanize society, 
The aim is to divinize humanity. We become more human by becoming more godlike. And the method, the method is the method of creating a structure that facilitates its own transformation and supersession. No regime that exists in the world is our definitive home. But what we can do is to create a structure that recognizes and develops our most important attribute, the attribute of transcendence. We are context-shaped agents. Uh, the social and conceptual worlds that we make and inhabit uh, shape us. But there is always more in us than there is in them. They are finite in relation to us, and we are infinite in relation to them. Our material interests in the development of our productive powers can converge with our moral interest in the creation of a world that allows us to become what we really and ultimately are.